Hello, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC 140. This is part two for the energy lecture. So we just left off in part one talking about enzymes and what enzymes do. What do enzymes do? Enzymes decrease the activation energy required for a reaction to take place. And by doing so, they make that reaction more likely to happen. And if you increase the likelihood of it to happen, you increase the, the speed of that reaction, the overall rate at which that reaction takes place. So let's look at some factors. Oh, and enzymes are unchanged. They're unchanged uh, throughout this process. They might wiggle a little bit induced fit model but after they after they're done catalyzing that reaction they return back to their original shape and can do it again enzyme activity is modulated in a number of ways so how many reactions take place in your body a lot and your body needs to control what reactions happen when, what reactions happen where, how fast reactions take place, how slow reactions take place. And a, lar a main way that this is done is by controlling enzyme activity, by modulating enzyme activity, changing, making enzymes more effective, less effective, making enzymes active or completely inactive. So these are four classifications of ways to modulate enzyme activity. Let's move on, and we'll have slides about each one of these. So that's coming up. So many enzymes are proteins. Most enzymes that we'll talk about are proteins. Um, some have RNA in them. Um, enzymes, most are proteins. The substrate of a enzyme cattle enzymatic uh, reaction is going to be the enzymatic reactant. So the substrate is the enzymatic reactant. Enzymes exhibit substrate specificity. So we're gonna talk, we already have talked about specificity some in this class. We're gonna talk about it a lot throughout this semester. So we're gonna go over again what, what specificity is. And I think this diagram over here really demonstrates it. So the shape of the active site, site determines substrate specificity. So let's look at protein X right here. Protein X is this orange shape. So we have enzyme or we have substrate A interact with protein X. We get a good fit. Perfect. It's able to catalyze. Uh, substrate A. Now we have substrate B. Substrate B has a similar shape, but it's got this little mound up on top. Good fit still, even though the shape's a little bit different, it can still fit in that enzyme. Good reaction. Reaction takes place. Now we're taking substrate C, having it bind to or interact with the enzyme. And even though it doesn't have, you know, these arms coming off the side, it's still able to interact with the enzyme. All three, A, B, and C, can interact with protein X. Now let's compare that to protein Y. Protein Y has the same shape as protein X, but it has these little nubs, these little arms coming up on either side of it. Well, is substrate A gonna be able to interact with it? No, these arms coming off the side of um, substrate A are gonna be blocked by these little nubs. Same with substrate B. When substrate B comes to interact, these little protrusions are going to block B from interacting with it. Form and function, right? Going all the way back to the first lecture. Now we got substrate C. Substrate C has short little arms on the side. Substrate C can bind and interact with protein Y. Protein Y 
is more specific. Protein Y has a higher degree of specificity than protein X. It requires more specific, a smaller number of things can interact with it. So some proteins or some enzymes catalyze like a class of reactions, like, like most peptide bonds, they'll break. Others are highly specific where there's like one ligand that can bind to it and have a reaction catalyzed and nothing else. You add or just subtract one hydrogen atom and boom, it doesn't work. It's highly specific. So there's varying levels of specificity. Um, but they're usually pretty specific, but there's a varying level. Affinity. Affinity is attraction. So attraction, the strength of the attraction between two things. So shape and chemistry of active site determines strength of interaction. So protein one has a positive charge in this shape. The ligand has a perfect fit and negative and positive are attracted, high affinity binding site. Protein two has no positive charge. Ligand uh, has still been as unchanged. The shape is perfect. There's no charge interaction, so it's an intermediate level of interaction. Down here, we have these extra little, these extra shapes, extra areas open for the protein. And we have the ligand come in and interact with the area. And there's no positive charge. It's not quite a perfect fit. You can see it probably still wiggles a little bit side to side down here. Low affinity binding site. So different ligands and different proteins will have different affinities for different things based on shape and chemistry. Based on shape and chemistry. Enzymatic substrate interaction depend on concentration and affinity. So substrate, uh, enzyme substrate interaction depends on concentration and affinity. If you increase the concentration, you increase the likelihood of the ligand and the protein to collide. If you look down here, we have four enzymes in box A and four enzymes in box B but we have a four substrate in A and eight substrate in B. In what situation is it more likely that the circle collides with the enzyme at that correct active spot? Well, there's more, um, more substrate. There's a higher likelihood of a collision in B. So you increase substrate concentration, you increase the reaction rate. If you increase the enzyme affinity, the, inner, uh, the strength of the attraction between the enzyme and the substrate, you'll increase these uh, interactions and you'll also increase the rate. So increase concentration, increase reaction rate. Increase affinity, increase reaction rate. So saturation. So we've already mentioned saturation, I think once this semester, but we really will talk about it throughout the semester in a number of situations. So it's important that you get this down. Saturation is when the com is the concentration at which all active sites are occupied. So if all active sites are occupied, there's no way to have more reaction taking place. If you have four enzymes and all four enzymes are actively bound to a substrate catalyzing a reaction, and you increase the concentration, there's not more enzyme that more substrate can bind to. It's the maximum reaction rate for that enzyme. Yes. So we have four enzymes in all of these boxes, A, B, C, D, and E. This graph, if we go to the right, we have substrate concentration. So going to the, the x-axis is increasing substrate concentration. The y-axis is reaction rate, so how fast this reaction is going forward. If you look at A, A is corresponded with right here, four substrate, four enzymes. We have a reaction rate of this. There's no units. If we move on to box B, we double the amount of substrate. We have eight substrate, 
and we've increased the reaction rate because we've increased the concentration, which increases the likelihood of a substrate contacting and interacting with an enzyme at the active site. At C, we've increased the concentration of substrate to 12, again, increasing the likelihood of a collision, which increases the reaction rate. At D, right here, we have so many substrate that at any moment, all four of our um, enzymes are bound to a substrate. The moment this substrate is done being catalyzed and pops off, the concentration is so high, and instantly another one binds to that protein. We then go to E, where we increase the concentration even more, but the reaction rate does not increase anymore because at all, at all moments, the reaction is at maximum speed because at any moment, all enzymes are catalyzing a reaction. There's no way to increase it further. Um, unless you added more enzymes, but which is four enzymes, there's no way to increase the reaction rate. So that's the point of saturation. This will come into play a couple times throughout the semester, uh, most notably, when we talk about diabetes. And so in diabetes, our kidneys filter glucose out of our bloodstream and then reabsorb that glucose. And there's a certain number of glucose reabsorbers within our kidneys. And normally, those reabsorbers are not saturated and they're able to reabsorb 100% of the glucose that gets filtered out of our blood and our kidneys. And so we do not urinate out any glucose. With diabetes, sometimes people's blood sugar gets so high that we reach the point of saturation for their glucose transporters. And so they cannot transport all of the glucose back into our bloodstream and some glucose will stay in our urine. And so diabetics will urinate out glucose if their blood sugar is too high because of saturation. The, trans the glucose transporters reach saturation. So let's talk about how to modulate enzyme activity. So enzyme activity can be modulated or changed. Enzyme activity uh, adjusted by environmental conditions. So temperature. Temperature can affect how enzymes function. Now, there is an optimal temperature, an optimal temperature at which enzymes function. Our bodies maintain specific temperatures. A, our body is homeostatically controlled to maintain a certain temperature because certain reactions take place at certain temperatures. Our, the chemical reactions needed for me to happen happen at a specific temperature. And so my body maintains that specific temperature. Temperature can alter the shape of enzymes which can alter their effectiveness, making them more or less optimized. Temperature can affect the rate of collisions and how much energy are within the collisions between substrate and enzyme, which can affect rate. And temperature can even affect the shape of enzymes so much that they become completely destroyed. Uh, so we call that protein denaturing. Protein denaturing is when the shape is permanently altered. The shape is permanently altered. Um, sometimes, so remember we talked about proteins, we talked about primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Sometimes when the temperature is not in the proper range, those, the bonds that hold the tertiary and quaternary shapes uh, become broken and the, the enzyme loses its shape, it becomes completely useless. So enzymes have characteristic optimal pH and temperature. So pH, is that the next slide? Yeah, okay, we'll get there. 
So right here, let's keep talking about temperature. So what's going on here? What's going on in this photo over here? So has anybody been to Lassen Volcanic, Volcanic Park up in NorCal? If you haven't, I highly recommend it. And I also highly recommend you stop by Bernie Falls and Mossbray Falls up in that area and have a great weekend up there. Uh, back to physiology. So this is Yellowstone. And in Yellowstone, there are pools of volcanically heated water. And so this water is always, these pools are always very hot. And there's been bacteria that's evolved to function in those, to live in those pools, to live at these very high temperatures. So the optimal temperatures for these enzymes are these thermophilic, so heat-loving, thermophilic, heat-loving, heat-tolerant bacteria, 77 degrees Celsius. That's hot. That's really hot. So right here, you can see the optimal temperature for the enzymes for this bacteria. We can go a little higher, a little bit lower, and it can still work, just not as optimally. And eventually, out of these ranges, they just stop working. Optimal temperature for the typical human enzyme, right around 37 degrees Celsius. Homeostatically regulated, right? So our bodies, our enzymes work generally in kind of this type of, type of bell curve. Right around 37, they work best. If it gets too hot, they become denatured, just don't work at all. Enzymes also have an optimal pH. So enzyme activity can be adjusted by environmental conditions. So pH, hydrogen ions, can alter acidic and basic charges and shield hydrogen bonds. So there is an optimal pH for specific enzymes. And different parts, different compartments, different parts of our body have different pHs. Remember how I said we compartmentalize our body so that we can have specific environments within those compartments which allow specific reactions to take place? Well, let's look at our stomach. Our stomach is very acidic. Pepsin is a stomach enzyme and its optimal pH is two. Over here, we have an intestinal enzyme, trypsin, and its optimal pH is eight. If you put trypsin in your stomach, it's not gonna function. If you put pepsin in your intestines, it's not gonna function. There's optimal pHs for the function of these enzymes. So this is a really, I love how, how this works right here. This really is like art, how this works right here. So enzyme functions best at a specific pH. So pepsin is designed to break down peptide bonds, so break down proteins and amino acids. Do you think it's a good idea to have active pepsin floating around your body? Do you want an enzyme that's designed to help break down you know, your food floating around your body? Sounds kind of dangerous, right? So how does your body handle that? Well, you've got these chief cells, these chief cells. I, so this is how I remember that it's the chief cells that create pepsin. It's because the chief drinks Pepsi. The chief drinks Pepsi, so pepsin. Uh, is created by these chief cells, but it's actually not pepsin that's created by the chief cells. Pe chief cells create something called pepsin ogen. So when you see ogen after a um, protein enzyme, it's like the inactive form. So the chief cells create pepsin ogen, which is like the inactive form of pepsin. You can see right here is the active site, the site that does the catalyzing, this thick part. But then there's this amino acid tail, this tail that comes around and loops around and blocks the active site so that no catalyzing can take place within the chief cell. The chief cell then secretes it through this mu you know, into our into the lumen, the space of our stomach. And once it goes through the mucus into the lumen of our stomach, it's in the acidic environment. And this acidic environment breaks the bonds or disrupts the bonds between this loop that blocks the active site and this tail. 
So the tail kind of unwinds, it kind of opens up like this. And then not only does that open up the active site, but it makes it so that that active site can actually autolytic, so self-cut, can also actively cut off this tail, making pepsin permanently open, permanently, you know, the active site permanently available. And that active site can actually go and cut off the tails of other pepsins. So we have active pepsin within our stomachs, but not active pepsin within our tissues where it can run amok and destroy our proteins. So pepsin activation ensures properly localized activity. We want pepsin to break protein uh, bonds and proteins within our stomach, but not within our cells. Chemical modification alters enzyme activity. So we've already, so cofactors. Cofactors are like vitamins. They're non-protein compounds bound to enzymes required for function. So many vitamins are cofactors for enzymes. They need to bind to the enzyme in order for the enzyme to function properly, a cofactor or a coenzyme. Allosteric modulators interact at a location other than the binding site to affect activity. So we need ATP to produce energy. And at times our cells use more energy, at times our cells use less energy, right? I mean, if you're running, if you're lifting weights, you're gonna be using more ATP than if you're just relaxing. You know, and there's lots of, yeah. So the ratio of ATP to ADP is actually really important. Remember, ATP is like the loaded spring, and ADP is like the, the unloaded spring. So this one can give energy, this one needs to be recharged to ATP. Well, ATP is always being turned into ADP, ADP is always being turned back into ATP within our cells. That ratio of ATP to ADP is important to regulate. And because they are allosteric mod uh, modulators, you know, they can affect the rate the, the balance between the two. And so they're a common allosteric modifier. So interacts at a location other than the binding site to affect the activity. So over here, you can see the example of an allosteric modifier. We have the inactive protein. So let's say we need more ATP. This is just a hypothetical example. So we're low in ATP, so we have a lot of ADP. So ADP is likely to bind to this inactive protein, turn it into an active protein, which allows the ligand to bind. And in this hypothetical situation, that will increase the rate at which ATP is made. Covalent modulators bind covalently to a protein to alter activity. So bind covalently to a protein to alter activity. So all of these, might increase the reaction rate, but they might decrease the reaction rate. All of these cofactor, allosteric modifier, covalent modifier, they might increase enzyme activity or they might decrease activity. Down here, when we get to inhibitors, inhibitors only decrease. They, they de competitive inhibitors only decrease, just by definition, uh, activity of an enzyme. So competitive inhibitors compete for the active site of the enzymes. We've mentioned these once before, I believe, in this class. They compete for the active site of an enzyme. So right here, we have the substrate binds the active site, reaction takes place, happy. Right here, we have a competitive inhibitor which binds the active site but doesn't have a reaction take place it just binds and blocks, kind of clogs up the, the machinery of this enzyme. It makes it so that this, you know, blob can't bind and be chemically be, have a reaction take place. With allosteric or non-competitive modulators, they bind away from the active site. There's no competition, but they alter the protein shape in a, in a significant enough way 
that they alter the active site. Now, these allosteric modifiers, allosteric modifiers, they can increase or decrease activity. Competitive inhibitors only decrease. Allosteric, increase or decrease. Um, modulators are, can be non-covalent or covalent. All right, so this is just looking at it another way. Specificity, competition, modifiers. You can see regulatory site, functional site, purple circle binds to the regulatory site. It changes the shape of the functional site and the ligand can bind. And the ligand can bind. So we actually have, so we've talked some about altering the function of enzymes to control reactions and how reactions take place. Well, we have other ways also. Utilizing separate enzymes for reversible reactions can help you control what reactions take place. So in some situations, a single enzyme can modulate enzymatic activity or amount and influence forward and reverse reactions. So right here, we've already talked about this this class. You have CO2 dissolved in water, and you have carbonic acid. When you have CO2 dissolved in water, some of it's going to turn into carbonic acid. And that reaction can be sped up by the presence of carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase catalyzes CO2 and H2O turning into carbonic acid, and also carbonic acid turning back into CO2 and H2O. It's a bidirectional, it's a single enzyme that catalyzes both directions. If you want to, if, if you want to have an effect on this, you know, you can modify carbonic anhydrase, but if you modify carbonic anhydrase, it's going to affect both directions, not just one direction. Any modification will affect the change in both directions. Influences forward and reverse reactions. Over here, we have glucose and phosphate, and we have glucose 6 phosphate and 5. So glucose 6 phosphate. With this, we have two different enzymes. One that modify that modulates or um, catalyzes glucose and phosphate turning into glucose 6 phosphate, and one that modify or that modulates it, sorry, one that catalyzes it the other direction. So hexokinase turns it into glucose 6 phosphate, and glucose 6 phosphatase turns it into glucose and phosphate. If you modify hexokinase, you modify one direction. If you modify glucose 6-phosphatase, you modify the reaction in one direction. So different ways to control how enzyme, how, what chemical reactions take place. Now, most things, most chemical reactions that take place in our body are actually parts of metabolic pathways. So there's not just one step from your starting molecules to your finished product molecules. There's, you have to turn A into B, then B into C, then C into D, and so on. Regulating these pathways are essential for homeostasis. So if you will need to turn A to B, then B to C, then C to D, you can regulate this pathway at enzyme one. You can also modify this pathway at enzyme two. You can also regulate this pathway at enzyme three. So your body has different strategies for controlling these pathways, for controlling these metabolic pathways. You can control enzymatic concentration. So control the concentration of enzyme one, control the concentration of enzyme two, either more or less. You can do it by modulating enzyme activity. Maybe you just modulate enzyme one. Maybe you just modulate enzyme three. There's different ways, different targets to modulate it. Maintain an optimum ratio of ADP to ATP. So you can come in and you can look at right here, allosteric modulators. Allosteric modulators. Using different enzymes to catalyze reversible reactions. So that's the example right here. You have more control with two enzymes controlling reversible reactions instead of just one enzyme controlling reversible reactions.
and then also isolating enzymes within organelles. So iso this is compartmentalization. Uh, I've talked about this a number of times throughout the semester so far. Isolating enzymes within organelles. Um, heck, you can even isolate enzymes within, you know, spaces of your body like pepsin. You know, you, you isolate active pepsin within the lumen or the, the opening of our stomach. So isolating enzymes within organelles or even, you know, the lumen of our stomach can help give us um, control. Metabolism. So you hear this term thrown around a lot just in life. Uh, my metabolism slow, my metabolism fast. Well, what is the scientific definition of metabolism? The scientific definition of metabolism is all chemical reactions within an organism. All chemical reactions. It's kind of a big term. Chemical reaction is the making or breaking of bonds. Ultimately, chemical reactions are transfers of energy, changes of energy. Remember, molecules are just favorable energetic reactions. There's not like, this kind of gets into chemistry a lot, you know, deeply, but there's not, it's better to think of chem, you know, of molecules, bonds between molecules as favorable energetic reactions. There's not like a solid bar in between each atom holding them together. And when that favorable chemical, you know, favorable energetic uh, relationship gets disrupted or changed, you can make or break bonds and make new molecules, transfer of energy. Anabolic reactions make bonds and they consume energy, they're endergonic. Think anabolic steroids that athletes take to get big and strong, they wanna build muscle, they wanna make bonds. Catabolic is breakdown and they release energy, they're exergonic. Free energy is potential energy stored in bonds. Uh, typically, molecules with lots of bonds have lots of energy. Uh, I mean, you can't have a single bond, like you can have a higher energy bond, a lower energy bond, like the bonds between the phosphate groups and ATP are really high energy bonds. But generally, you're gonna have more free energy within a molecule just by having lots of bonds. So fat molecules, have lots of bonds. There's lots of free energy within it. Fewer bonds, less energy. There's gonna be more bonds in a triglyceride than in a glucose molecule. There's gonna be more energy in a triglyceride than in a glucose molecule, a lot more. So metabolic reactions are organized into pathways. Metabolism manages material and energy resources in the cell. Enzymatic regulation balances metabolic supply and demand. So right here, we looked at A goes to B, goes to C, goes to D, with an enzyme modulating each, each reaction. Well, let's look at this. So we have our reactants. Enzyme one catalyzes reactant to intermediate. Intermediate uh, interacts with enzyme two, turns it to our next intermediate. Enzyme three pulls off the product, and also what's left over becomes part of the reactant at the beginning. Uh, the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, which we're going to talk about very soon, uh, and the production of ATP looks kind of like this, this circle right here. Pathway regulation can be external or internal. So external regulation can be coming from somewhere else. So a hormone, where a hormone is a molecule produced in one part of your body, which sends a signal to another part of your body. So extracellular outside, you can have outside control. Some hormones move into your cells and they affect enzyme activity, outside control. Other pathways have a control component it's within, that, within that, that pathway. So let's look at this feedback inhibition right here. We have A uses enzyme one to turn into B, uses enzyme two to turn into C, uses enzyme three to turn into Z. Z inhibits enzyme one. 
So let's say we needed to have an ideal amount of Z. And let's say we had too much Z, a lot of Z. So we have way too much Z, more Z than we need. Well, then there's going to be more Z floating around in our cell and more inhibition of enzyme one, which slows the production of Z. If we slow the production of Z, we're going to have less Z over time. Now let's say we don't have enough Z, we have very little Z. Well, if we, have, we don't have enough C, we have very little C, we want this reaction, this pathway to take place, there's gonna be very little inhibition of enzyme one. Little bit of Z, little bit of inhibition of enzyme one, pathway moves forward faster. This is kind of how ATP and ADB work uh, as a potent metabolic regulator. And then compartmentalization, which I've talked about throughout this semester. You can see here with, uh, glycolysis and producing ATP. Some reactions take place in our cytosol, some take within the mitochondria. There's compartmentalization which allows this to take place. All right, have a great day everybody and I'll see you in the next video. Email me if you have questions.